Namaste and welcome and hello from Berlin. I welcome all of the participants of uh, the fifth um, German-Indian Business Dialogue. And uh, together with my co-host, uh, Ambassador Mukta Thoma, we want to give you an uh, impression of how we can strengthen our relationship between India and Germany for the fifth time. Um, and uh, I'm glad that we have um, lots of participants, even in difficult times, uh, from all over the country of India and Germany. I welcome, of course, uh, Ambassador Mukta Thoma, and I'm thankful that you once again host uh, such an event, such a dialogue, uh, together with myself. I also welcome Hans-Peter Friedrich, uh, who is the Vice President of the German Parliament, Dr. Bingmann, who is the President of ICC, uh, the Honorable Member and uh, Union Minister um, of State uh, for Finance and Corporate Affairs in India, Anurag Thakur, and of course, all speakers from the business community, from Parliament and uh, dear guests. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic um, has severely affected our global economy. And this created a lot of challenges. One of the challenges uh, is even that we cannot meet in person. But we also believe that in every challenge, there are also opportunities, and especially for partners and for strategic uh, friends like India and Germany. And we want to strengthen this partnership even in critical times. And we want to discuss opportunities together with you, how we can strengthen our cooperation of our two countries. We have seen as a first, um, as a first, um, uh, um, I, idea of the COVID-19 and interruption of our supply chains. And um, this showed um, a huge uh, weakness of our economies. And uh, we see now that we have also had a strong dependency on individual countries and that there's um, a need to diversify our supply chain management. We also believe that um, India can be a good partner for Germany when it comes to this diversifying strategy. We believe that India uh, can be a partner uh, when it comes to digitalization. India is uh, uh, in the top of the world when it comes uh, to programmers, when it comes to skilled um, people who work in the field of digitalization. So how can we organize a knowledge transfer? How can we organize skill development and also uh, a skilled workers program that we have decided on in the German parliament last year in 20. 19. We believe that um, today's event offers multiple um, op opportunities to interact, interact with the speakers, interact in a networking event, and also uh, to find new partners, friends, and allies uh, for your distinguished um, um, uh, topics that you want to discuss. So I want to invite you um, to stay um, with us uh, for the keynote presentations, for um, the panel discussion and also for the networking afterwards to make it a live event even in times that we can only meet uh, online. Uh, I want to thank all of you for your participation, for your uh, support um, for this event. Uh, I thank all the partners that uh, have been um, working with us in, in an enormous way to make it possible and to make it happen. I now welcome uh, Ambassador Mukta Thoma who has been an amazing representative of uh, the great state of India in Germany, uh, who is uh, fighting for Indian interests uh, here in Germany and in Europe, and who is a great partner uh, to work with when it comes to daily political, economical, and cultural um, questions. So all the best to all of you, and uh, I'll give the word now to Ambassador Mukta Thoma. Namaste. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, Dr. Hans-Peter Friedrich, uh, Vice President of the German Bundestag, uh, a very warm welcome to you, sir. Um, Chairman of the International Chambers of Commerce, Dr. Bingman, um, members of the business community in India and Germany, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to begin by thanking my co-host, a member of the Deutsche Bundestag, Mr. Mark Hauptmann, 
and I join him in welcoming you today for the fifth Indo-German Business Dialogue. The Embassy of India on Tiergartenstrasse in Berlin has been the venue for this annual dialogue since its beginning. The digital format of this year's dialogue is a reflection of the changed times that we live in since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. We started the new year on a positive note. Um, Intergovernment and consultations uh, were held in India in, on November 1st, uh, 2019. This was co-chaired by Prime Minister Modi and Chancellor Merkel. And we were following up on the outcomes of this, of these consultations. In February this year, External Affairs Minister Dr. Uh, Jashankar visited Germany and Development Cooperation Minister Dr. Gerd Müller visited India. And these visits underlined the shared values of democracy, rule of law, and our mutual respect. Um, the COVID pandemic has changed everything. No one had anticipated it or was prepared for the chaos it would unleash. Countries put in place measures bearing in mind the best interest of their population and based on their national circumstances. These measures ranged from a complete lockdown like India did in the initial months to restrictions on businesses and public activities as in Germany. Each choice carried its opportunity cost and ramifications. In the case of India, the priority of the government was to ensure that the high number of infections do not translate into high mortality rate and that the health system does not get overwhelmed at any stage. The lockdown in the initial days in India gave us critical time to prepare for ramping up production of essential health items, procuring critical items like ventilators, test kits, PPs, etc., many of these from Germany, and carrying out mass awareness on hygiene protocol. Today, despite the high number of cases, India has a COVID mortality rate of 1.7% against the world average of 3.2 and Germany's 3.6 and a recovery of 77%. Today in India, we have over 1 million tests per day, and we are largely self-sufficient in most aspects, including manufacturing of ventilators and other essentials. The lockdown in India was gradually phased out to allow economic activities to resume. A 250 billion euro support package was announced with special focus on small and medium sized companies, farmers and infrastructure development. A process of overhauling the legal framework for land and labor was initiated and liquidity infused through the Atma Nirbhar Bharat initiative. Most significantly, all sectors, including key strategic ones, such as space, have been opened for private investment. The efforts of government of the government have begun to show results. Railway freight, which is a good indicator of economic activity, was 95% of last year's level in July. While in August, it was 6% higher over that of last year. We have a normal monsoon this year and the agriculture sector that contributes 16% of our GDP is expected to perform well. Key economic indicators had been trending upwards from October 2019 to February 2020 and dropped from March with the lockdown. However, the high frequency indicators such as PMI manufacturing, eight core sectors, e-way bills, power consumption, railway freight, cargo traffic, uh, etc. are now converging to levels observed at the time 
uh, at the same time last year and indicate the green shoots of recovery in the economy. So what opportunities does the present situation offer for India-Germany cooperation? We see that businesses are insulating themselves against supply chain disruptions by diversifying the supply chains and through digitization. India-Germany partnership is well poised to take advantage of both these trends. India's IT capabilities need no introduction and businesses on both sides are already working in the area of AI and digitization. On the issue of supply chains, there is an even greater political momentum in India to becoming a manufacturing hub for domestic as well as global exports. India's knowledge-based economy, a growing market driven by a large and aspirational middle class and sustained investments in infrastructure provide the basis for its potential. In addition, there is a great deal of convergence in the political ambition on both sides for combating climate change and to cooperate in the economic opportunities it offers. I would be remiss not to mention the opportunities in cooperation for a COVID vaccine. Both countries have potential vaccine candidates at different stages of development. Indian companies are among the world's largest manufacturers of vaccines and ARV drugs. An India-Germany partnership could not only expedite the R&D of a vaccine, but also make it available to the world. The pandemic has highlighted the value in working with democratic and transparent partners. A lot of lives, jobs, and money would have been saved if the world had received information on the outbreak of the pandemic in a timely and transparent manner. The pandemic has assigned an economic value to the intangible concepts of democracy and transparency in the form of foregone profits and growth, while reminding businesses that these values are a prerequisite for sustainability of profits in the long run. International cooperation will remain the bedrock of India's fight against COVID. We will continue to work with partners like Germany and the EU towards a recovery that is aligned with the common aspirations of sustainable and inclusive development and climate protection. I thank you for your attention and wish you good deliberations today. Namaste. Mr. Ha Dr. Hans-Peter Friedrich, we welcome your remarks as the Vice President of the German Parliament. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. Namaste. Uh, first question, can you hear me? I have some problems with my microphone today. Is it okay for you? I'm trying to speak a little bit louder than usually. Uh, dear Ambassador, Mrs. Uh, Mukta Dromar, it's always a pleasure to meet you. Uh, dear Mr. Minister, uh, dear friend and colleague Mark Hauptmann, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to say congratulations for the fifth Indo German business dialogue um, in this year only as a video conference, uh, but this is not unusual in this time because each of us had uh, joined a lot of uh, conferences during the last weeks and months, and we are used to uh, communicate uh, uh, on the computer. And we, re we realized it works, but I must say it's much more better to uh, meet in person. And I really hope that we can do this next year uh, on the sixth uh, Indo-German uh, business dialogue. Well, ladies and gentlemen, particularly in difficult times, it's necessary to have a dialogue. And personally, I'm fortunate uh, that I, not even in the crisis, in the pandemic crisis, um, 
had interrupted my contact to India because, as you know, Mr. Ambassador, in my constituency in Hof, there is a Bavarian Indian center located, and I have hundreds of young women and men from India studying at the Hof University. And it was really great to see uh, how they organized their life during the lockdown with um, modern technology and modern media. And it was great that I had uh, only uh, also in, the, in this time a close uh, contact with them. However, what you said before, the effects of the pandemic uh, crisis and lockdown on our economies in India as well as in Germany uh, is very serious. In Germany, the gross domestic product fell more than 10% compared uh, to the previous year, and the downturn is the, the downturn is um, is even more severe than during the financial crisis uh, 2008 and 2009. And we are also seeing in India um, a severe implication of the economy, uh, coupled with a dramatic increase of unemployment. Nevertheless, we must say, and you all know this word, in every crisis there is a chance, but we must identify the chance and we must use it. And uh, for the governments, also for the parliaments, the question is what policy should we choose? And I think in those days it's very important to channel all the money, to channel all the funds into modernization, modernization of infrastructure, modernization of education, communication, energy generation, and of course, digitalization. Because uh, the digital transformation of the economy has been an important topic in all areas of economy in recent years, also before the pandemic crisis. But we also have to learn the right lessons from the pandemic. In my opinion, the consequence of pandemic cannot be to increase protectionism and cannot be reversing globalization. Because one thing must be clear, uh, the international division of labor, of global trade, of international investments are the foundation of prosperity in the world, in all regions of the world, and on this way, a uh, foundation of social stability. Uh, and so I think global cooperation must continue to advance. The global economy must not move to unbundling of supply chain and decoupling of economies. What we need is not decoupling, what we need is diversifying. Because the same what applies to successful businesses also applies to national economies. You must not depend on very few suppliers or very few sales opportunities. You need diversification in sales markets and in supplier structures. Following this logic, Trade, cooperation, and investment in all regions of the world is necessary for Germany as well as for India. And therefore, India, with its huge potential, is not only interesting to us as a sales market, but also as a supplier. So India is a very important pillar in our efforts for diversification. And I'm very pleased that uh, German-Indian roundtables are set up all over the country in Germany where people can exchange their ideas, their experiences, uh, and um, uh, the opportunities the, the co of cooperation. And I must say I'm particularly very pleased that my friend and colleague Mark Hauptmann and his colleagues have made this business dialogue a successful tradition. Congratulations. I wish you all the best and uh, every success and I hope for a good future together for Germany and India. Good luck.
Yes, it seems that to be the right moment to jump in. I hope that everybody can hear me, everybody can see me. I think hearing is much more important. Thank you very much for, for inviting me. Good afternoon in, in the name of the International Chamber of Commerce to discuss a little bit about um, industrial trade relations between our, our two countries. Um, maybe you, you ask yourself, what is the International Chamber of Commerce? Um, I'm, I'm very proud to represent uh, um, an association who is the elder brother of the WTO and who is in, in these difficult times even the more solid partner um, um, as, it, as it looks like. Um, right, even right after the First World War, um, a handful of entrepreneurs throughout the world decided to create an organization that would represent businesses uh, everywhere. And they already believed, what we do have to believe in now more than ever, is that uh, a, a functioning trade between our countries plays a really influential role in fostering peace and prosperity around uh, our nations. And uh, so I think that the, the original idea of an international chamber created in 1920 um, is much more alive than, than it seems to. And, I, and an international chamber is on the one hand taking care about technical regulations uh, about trade, is involved in 95% of all the trade contracts uh, everybody of you has uh, between himself and his uh, companies that you are trading in. On the same hand, we apply to uh, International Court of Arbitration that is still functioning in the first phase and in the second. So we definitely represent a lot of um, inter international, uh, high-level intergovernmental decision-making process. We are lucky to have an observation status at the United Nations in New York. We are part of the WTO program. We are part of the G20. And um, we, are, we are what we call the, the technical background for international trade. The funny thing is Germany was created inside that organization in 1925 and India is already created itself at its International Chamber Commerce Office in 1929. So once again this shows how our two nations are since quite some 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 sometimes so so close and uh, not to forget Sunil Bharti who was from Mittal who was ICC chairman for a couple of years. Having said this um, about ICC, I would like to, to, to leave maybe my script here a little bit and jump into what is, what is I think, even more important in these times is uh, how, how, can we, how can we return to some, some normal, normal trade relations and what is happening throughout the world. I absolutely agree with the speakers before me that our supply chain, supply chains are in crisis, our relations, relations are in crisis, um, and this is something we need to work on. But how can we work on this? My personal, my personal passion is talk to each other, understand each other, uh, try to create. Um, try to create a mutual understanding for, for each other. Um, we have we had these difficulties in world trade since some years. Um, we had an American policy, which we don't agree totally. We have a Chinese policy that is difficult for the rest of the world. And in between, there are some countries who, for my personal understanding, definitely would have the the role or even the task to talk more to each other. We don't want a G2 with some lost areas like Europe, Arabia, India, Russia. So we don't want that G2. We need to talk to each other. We need to developing our 
our business is we, we have seen such a long time and we have in a volume which I made at later, but my, my personal personal passion is we, we, we need we need to talk to each other and uh, try to identify possibilities in, 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 that, in, in that way of mutual understanding that is running your country who did such a fantastic um, way in the last 80 years, developing it in a very solid, peaceful, but strengthful way. And I, 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 I don't dare to compare Germany and India in size, in population, but um, I think that we have pretty much the same attitude to do our business and really to want to want to bring business forward. That's why I'm absolutely uh, hopefully that conferences like this one and roundtables um, are the right way of learning more about each other and uh, staying in a, in, a, in, a, in a close contact to each other. Let me point out one point, what I really, being a representative of international trade, what I really like in India is you're absolutely, absolutely pointing on multilateral cooperation and international trade, rules-based trade. India joined already the, the Alliance for Multilateralism, an initiative launched by France, by Germany government last year. We are both together with Japan, with Brazil, we are part of the G4, which is championing a reform of the United Nations and the Security Council. We are together in the G24, which is absolutely dominant to make the security, the security Council more representative, more legitimate, more legitimate, and more effective. On the other hand, we try to negotiate a free trade agreement between your country and the European Union since 2007. And this is something that I would really, in, in, in that phase of revitalizing old friendships, um, strengthening mutual understanding, I, I really ask our political leaders in, in, in returning to the table to, and I'm very hopefully that the signal that uh, that has been sent out by the European Commission and, and your Prime Minister throughout the last month that to develop to to set up um, a high level high level dialogue on investment and trade. This should definitely end in a free trade agreement. And as we all know, free trade agreement is not only an agreement on trade. It is always easening the contacts between you, between all our businesses, between, or well, it is easening our the exchange of the younger generation in order to study somewhere around the world, um, and learn the culture of the other, and bringing by doing so our relations much more further than than some official contacts. So. Absolutely. Let's try really to, to, to find that free trade agreement. Second thing, especially, uh, let's, let's, let's have one thing, one little, little idea on, on the relation between your country, the, the, the economic relation between your country and ours. Germany is the fourth largest economy. India is the seventh largest economy in the world. Both are, of course, G20, B20. These economic relations between the two dates be, be, date back more than 500 years, so definitely much more longer than a lot of economic relations we have in this. It has increased, it, it has, since the last years. Of course, we had the corona year, and of course, we all know that uh, this year will be a drop in in, um, in in a common business, but Germany is India's most important trading partner in Europe and among India's top 10 trading partners worldwide. Before the corona pandemic, our bilateral trade between Germany and India had a volume of 21 billion euros in 2019, which was, was definitely nearly 20% higher than the year before. Um, this is a fantastic, fantastic thing we managed there, and I see it under the light of this continuing 
really trying to, to, to do business with together, and this is absolutely important. Once again, um, the, the invests we do in each other, others of our country. Um, Germany is the seventh largest foreign direct investor in, in India, with a total invest of about 9 billion euros. Um, more than 1,600 Indo-German corporations we have in the world. And so definitely more than 600 joint ventures even, which are directly just to give you an impression how close we are together and what we can still make out of it is nearly a half a million of jobs in, in India are related to German companies. So I think um, if we truly try to come to bring us even more closer, also with, of course, always having the Mittelstand in, in mind, um, I, I really think that we, we can do a wonderful, a wonderful job in there. Let me just point out one single point, which is, of course, the, the One Belt, One Road initiative um, and your, uh, your very clear position on this. And I think it is very important or very interesting that since 2018, the European Union took a step to create an alternative to the single, to the Silk Road or whatever you call it, with its Europe-Asia connectivity strategy. Um, with, a, with its strong emphasis on, on a sustainable, uh, comprehensive, rule-based approach, I think this is something that could, that could add to an to a even more stronger relation between our countries, which we all, as the previous speaker have mentioned it before, which we all see already into digitalization. You are a country with, with so, many, so many fantastic uh, results or efforts in digitalization from which we can really learn in Germany. If you look especially also public administration, um, definitely we, we could learn from each other. Let's try to really to, to get in a more intense touch with this. So Mark Hauptmann, thank you very much for bringing all us, of us together the rest of the day and really seeing what we have already, but keeping in mind that we are definitely on the same way of thinking the future. And um, I'm absolutely open in, in discussing whatever, uh, and I really like the relations between your country and Germany. Thank you very much. Her Excellency Ambassador Mukta Toma, Indian Ambassador to Germany, Mr. Mark Hoffman, Member of German Parliament and Founder of Indo-German Business Dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you. Namaste. Willen Dank der Simmisch Jumfun in the German Business Dialogue 2020. Engel Aden Haben. Indian und Deutschland in my personal relationship with Germany is over two decades long. I hope my friend Mark Hoffman's Hindi is as good as my German. Thank you for inviting me, Mark. It's good to see you again, Ambassador Toma. The COVID-19 pandemic is an important turning point in modern history and offers an opportunity to force a new vision of globalization focused on the shared interest of humanity as a whole. The COVID-19 pandemic has unsettled the world, undermined established norms, underlined the importance of good health in our personal lives, businesses, and the economy as a whole. It has disrupted supply chains, hampered business models. It has made us rethink, reimagine, reset our lives and livelihoods. Despite the adversity facing us, India has decided to turn this into an opportunity. 
and saying it again, India has decided to turn this into an opportunity. The world grapples with the pandemic. India under Prime Minister Modi has decided to reboot, reform and research on the path of Atmanirbhar Bharat for economic revival. Atmanirbhar Bharat is the vision of self-reliant India and creates value and wealth for all, accelerates growth, integration and opportunities for Indians and the world at large. Global economic resilience can be achieved by stronger domestic economic capacities. This means expanding our domestic manufacturing base, a robust financial system, diversification of international trade. This opens up vast opportunities for companies to expand, collaborate and accelerate growth. And I'm saying it again, it tells us to accelerate growth, expand as well. In the sectors of defense production, atomic energy and space, we have announced our intentions to opening up of these sectors and invite private companies on board. In sectors like agro-food processing, this is the right time to invest in India. Indian rural economy has been growing from strength to strength and with the formalization of economy, we will see more rural towns being connected to the supply chain of goods and services. This is the right time to invest in the logistics sector and Germany is the market leader in this. Our intention is to provide a seamless logistical connection for our manufacturing units and the agriculture hub as well. Starting from the farm gate or the manufacturing unit to road, rail, air and ports. This physical infrastructure will be supported by a robust digital clearance framework that facilitates trades and accelerates growth. In order to smoothen the process of imports and exports in India, contactless process called Turant Custom, which means swift customs clearance. Importers will avail benefits with the elimination of routine interface with the customs officers. So you won't have routine interface with the customs officers, which will provide uniformity in assessment across the country. We have also made our taxation system simpler through faceless assessment and faceless appeals. This brings more transparency, swiftness and seamlessness into the, into the taxation system. In September last year, we have announced a historic reduction in the corporate tax rates to 20% for the existing businesses and 15%, I'm saying it again, only 15% for newly set up manufacturing enterprises. This is one of the best and the most competitive tax rates globally. The world is well aware of Prime Minister Modi's push towards digital India's and the love for technology. In fact, India has witnessed a digital revolution in the last three, four years. From 400 million new bank accounts, 400 million new bank accounts opening up to direct bank payments and to over 1 billion monthly UPI based app payments. Millions coming online and connecting via mobile devices. This happens only in India. 1.4 billion transactions on the UPI platform. Let me also bring Her Excellency Ambassador Mukta Toma, Indian Ambassador to Germany, Mr. Mark Hoffman, Member of German Parliament and Founder of Indo-German Business Dialogue. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening to all of you. Namaste. Will and Dang Desimish Jumfun in the German Business Dialogue. 2020, Engel Aden Indian in Deutschland in Besandre Freunde.
my personal relationship with germany is over two decades long i hope my friend mark hopman's hindi is as good as my german thank you for inviting me mark it's good to see you again ambassador toma so covid 19 pandemic is an important turning point in modern history and offers an opportunity to forge a new vision of globalization focused on the shared interest of humanity as a whole the covid 19 pandemic has unsettled the world undermined established norms underlined the importance of good health in our personal lives businesses and the economy as a whole it has disrupted supply chains hampered business models it has made us rethink reimagine reset our lives and livelihoods despite the adversity facing us india has decided to turn this into an opportunity i'm saying it again india has decided life good afternoon ladies and gentlemen it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you to our panel discussion covid-19 the never normal and the way out i have a group of eminent panelists here with me which i briefly want to introduce to you and please don't be surprised that dr reddy is not with us yet she is joining any moment because she has another webinar at the moment with one of the un um, councils and therefore she will join any moment um, the three panelists that i have with me at the moment uh, one is ravi chandran puro shotanan he is the president of danfoss industries and what you may not know or see he is basically a german because he worked and lived with siemens I think for two decades he lived in Germany. He speaks German, and Danfoss, being a company on the in Denmark though, but on the German border and very big in Germany, is also somewhere almost a German company. So from that angle, welcome to you, sir, and thank you very much. Looking forward to discussing with you. Then we had have Satyakan Ayan. He is also almost a German because he works. for a german company daimler everybody knows daimler and he's been with them basically since they put up their plant in chennai in 2009 he was one of the key persons with mr listo sella to build up the company and today as you can see from the logos they are representing not on not only building uh, daimler cars they're building fuso they're building which is a is a japanese company freightliner which is an american company then of course they have the famous barat benz which is a is a new brand they created for india and when today we are discussing about make in india they have invented it long before the prime minister has invented it so therefore warm welcome to you and then of course we have klaus neumann everybody knows klaus neumann klaus neumann uh, is mr sap in india Uh, because he started SAP in India, uh, basically, or he came to India in the year 2000, and at that point in time, SAP had some 50 people in India. And when he then left, I think in 2015 or 16, when he left, they had more than 7,000 people. And of course, he was promoted uh, to run all the global SAP labs uh, in uh, from Sh Shanghai. but in his heart he is still an indian so from that angle i'm so happy to have this eminent group of panelists with me we have about half an hour and as you hear from the uh, topic that i have chosen the never normal and the way out some people are saying the new normal 
This we should not accept. COVID is not the new normal. This cannot be normal. The way we've been living in the last half a year is not normal. And this is not how human beings live. Maybe we've been living in certain ways wrong also in the past when we look at environment and other things. But this is not normal. So from that angle, we have to see what is the way out. And this is what I would like to discuss with the panelists to see how their companies are prepared for the way out and how um, uh, the, 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 the industries are also using that situation and how they are making actually the best out of it. And maybe I start uh, with class because the IT industry and especially SAP are maybe one of the most beneficiary of this pandemic and the desperate need for digitalization and going online. Uh, and basically all the SAP people in India, they're all working from home and suddenly they discover, oh, it's quite efficient and it works quite well. So class, how do you see the current situation for SAP, but also for your industry? Please. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, Bernhard, also for your kind introduction and your kind words. And indeed, I would say my, my heart uh, to a large extent still beats uh, in Bangalore, uh, where I have lived for, for more than uh, 12 years, actually, as you know. Um, yeah, I think the, for the IT industry, indeed, uh, the situation right now is not uh, gloomy now across all different uh, companies. Yeah, I mean, there are certainly uh, some companies globally um, who have been um, yeah, benefiting also from the fact that more people uh, work from home, uh, more people uh, are at, actually at home. And, and if you are on that side, that you deliver cloud services, uh, either in a, in a platform way or in a background noise, but I will just continue probably our colleague. It's fine, it's fine. Yeah. Um, there, so there, I believe uh, there you had obviously very good uh, opportunities now. And I think those services uh, have been uh, asked for by companies and consumers alike to a very, very large extent. And you have seen this probably also in the in the annual results of companies like like uh, Ali or Amazon or Google and the like, and um, and also the Indian IT industry, I think um, has been doing okay. It was a little bit mixed. Some some Indian IT companies uh, could adjust a bit better and then uh, also showed growing revenues. Others are rather flat, but nevertheless, the the sector overall. Uh, is going, I would say, quite well through this crisis because, A, um, yes, uh, the, the products and solutions of the IT industry is, are something that is in uh, high demand if they are smart. And B, the, 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 the crisis has really accelerated this even further. The digitalization trend has been further accelerated through this crisis. Yeah? All of a sudden, companies realize, oh, uh, I, I don't have visibility of the supply chain, right? We, we heard uh, Ambassador Tomar and, and uh, both Mr. Bingman and others speaking about supply chain issues. If, if you had a good software and, and you have good visibility and you're part of a B2B marketplace, you were much faster able to change the supply chain, to get additional vendors in, to know what's happening. And also you would know that the demand also much better and not hit by so many surprises uh, every single day. So there are... Many reasons um, why this is um, why the, the IT industry is quick to adjust, and the other reason, the third one, is probably that indeed, yes, our engineers across the globe, all these thirty thousand engineers we have uh, in core R and D, uh, although the majority of them still work from home, uh, we have found mechanisms to make this for time being also very efficient. And the last, uh, maybe just here. Uh, we, we realized in India also that even the patent ratio, that means the ratio of patents our colleagues apply for uh, internationally has gone up in this phase, which means, yes, maybe a few colleagues finally found the time to bring their great ideas to a paper and file for it. Uh, these are maybe a few of those positive stories besides all the gloomy part also. But that being said, 
uh, we are also very empathetic to our customers. We know, of course, that many business areas are really in trouble and we try our very best to help every single customer also to go through this crisis together with us. Yeah, Klaas, thank you very much. Um, uh, indeed, sometimes I'm saying that we are lucky that the crisis has only hit us now because just imagine it would have come five or ten years ago. We would have not been possible to have webinars like this. We have, would have not been possible to communicate the way we do and work from home would also have been impossible. So we would be, well, we would be stuck at home but no work from home. So from that That's angle, uh, with, with the good help, of course, of companies like SAP, we, we are managing fairly well. Now coming to uh, Mr. Aya, of course, the uh, car industry is more than 100 years old, developed, but they've also gone through a lot of challenges in the last couple of years. And they thought already that it's very difficult, very difficult. Now suddenly they are hit with something like Corona, where the sales of trucks, basically in April, not one single truck was sold in India, and the sales of truck has really collapsed. Now, this is a situation where companies like Daimler have to adjust dramatically. So my question to you is, how uh, does Daimler, how are they, you in the position to handle disruptions like that and still manage? There are companies when even the sales go down by 40, 50%, they still can be profitable because they're able to adjust. So how did you learn to adjust? And what is your way forward to adjust to crisis like this, still manage and survive? Well, thank you, Bernard. Uh, you're absolutely right. The automotive industry is hit quite hard with this crisis, especially the medium and heavy commercial vehicle segment. Uh, but the answer to your question um, actually lies in one simple sentence, uh, which is a very old saying. Uh, the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. And I think automotive industry over the periods has learned how to sweat in peace that we can bleed less in war. Right? And that's the principle, frankly, we have been following. And just to share with my fellow panelists and the audience on what this industry is going through. Well, uh, in 2019 itself, uh, the entire industry went down by 35% as compared to 2018. So we were already in crisis before COVID came in. You know, as they say, the natural immunity was already less uh, when another harder crisis hits you. And right now, uh, in 2020, uh, after COVID, uh, we are down by 85% on top of 2019, right? So uh, to give you simple uh, statistics, if 100 trucks were sold in 2018, now only 17 are being sold. So that's the situation we are in, right? And what we have decided uh, to deal with, how to deal with it is in very simple, let's say principle of four R's. Uh, the first one is reboot. Uh, the second is resilience. Uh, the third is reimagine. And the fourth is reform, right? So we are simply following this principle across our company. And let me just briefly tell you about each four of them and what have we achieved so far. Well, we were talking about uh, the supply chains earlier. Uh, that was one of the main points which was mentioned on the stage uh, by various speakers. And automotive industry typically has very comprehensive, well laid out, well thought over global supply chains, right? And uh, never ever in this history of the world that they were shut down so abruptly and had to be restarted in a totally different manner, right? So uh, it, it, quite a lot of effort is right now being put in rebooting this entire value chain. And uh, let's not forget that we have to do this in the new ways of working, which is the physical distancing, you know, which also throws a lot of challenges. So that's the first R, reboot. And I'm happy to say uh, that we have been able to do it quite well. Uh, in fact, we are working in two shifts right now, not a single shift. Uh, the second thing, which is unique to the Indian automotive industry, uh, as compared to, for example, Germany or other parts of the world is, right at the height of COVID, we switched to Bharat stage six emission norms from BS4, right? Which is a huge leap uh, for the entire industry. 
and that of course leads to the fact that the material cost or the cost of the products is higher leading to higher prices and when the market is in such situation it's difficult to pass on uh, the price to the customer like that's the unique challenge we had on top now uh, the second r is the resilience which i talked about you know whenever crisis like this strikes you have to eventually uh, once again go back to the drawing board and relook at your costs whether it's variable costs or fixed costs you have to look at your investments what do you need to replan reprioritize what do you need to just keep away for the time being um, and what do you need to in fact prepone uh, because that's what this crisis demands for example digitalization so that's an exercise which we have been doing since 2019 and i'm happy to say that we have been able to get good results on that in fact uh, you said in the beginning bernard that we are a good example of make in india 90% of our supply chain is local by value so that helped us during this crisis time because we were able to ramp up faster right uh, another thing since i mentioned about ds6 was you know uh, knowing that the cost of the products will go up we focused on the value to the customer you know bharat benz was always providing value for money trucks right and we said while we can't control the price on one hand let's focus on the value which the customer gets out of a commercial vehicle it's a it's a business uh, tool uh, and that's actually 90% of the life cycle cost of a truck and i'm happy to say that we we made it better than a bs4 so the result of that is that we have more than doubled our market share in after covid uh, after introduction of bs6 and that's why we have switched to uh, uh, double ships uh, and in fact august uh, just the last month which went by we had grown by double digit percentage as compared to previous august and we were the only cv company in india to do so so you know resilience is also cre- about creating alternate revenue streams and be more profitable in your core business as well well the third and the fourth are i will very briefly touch upon the third is reimagine uh, we just talked about digitalization new ways of working or remote working uh, we are preparing our company that in the next 3 years we will be fully digitally transformed uh, both on the interface to the customer side and internal operations and i think this will help us a long way in bringing down our operation costs which i think we need uh, during the time of this crisis and then the final are uh, reform well we need to be flexible if you ask me what will happen tomorrow we all don't know we can only put our best guesses and the reform is uh, making us more flexible and agile and to adapt to different scenarios which may emerge while we all uh, hopefully come out of this crisis so we have changed the steering model of the company uh, typically companies are steered by different functions right uh, now we are steering them by time horizon so cross functional steering by time horizons some people who are working only to secure this month some people are working to secure one year and the others are working to prepare us better when the crisis ends so in a nutshell this is the uh, the the game plan which we have prepared and are following uh, to lead us through this crisis yeah thank you very much that's indeed very nice i like your four r's like four wheels of a solid car yeah. ravi uh, you are as i mentioned half german Uh, but you are also uh, a chamberman if i may say so in the industry you are very strong in cii uh, and, and of course uh, dr reddy she is the president of fiki so we have the eminent um, apex bodies here and by the way klaus neumann is a past president of indo german chamber of commerce and currently he is the president of the german chamber in shanghai so from that angle i think it's remarkable to have so eminent representatives of the business association as well now ravi when we discussed <coughs> what your topic would be um we agreed that you should elaborate on what was the big topic before corona and that was climate change and environment protection and it's sometimes bizarre we think that with corona now it's only corona and nothing else but fact of the matter climate change is still very much there and just This week, the European Parliament came up with a new um, climate policy where they want to reduce emissions from the level of 1990 by, I think, more than 50 percent. Huge challenge for the car industry, for instance. Now, therefore, we want to discuss with you how you and Danfoss 
see the situation with regard to environment in especially India. We couldn't breathe in Delhi. The big topic when the chancellor was there in November and uh, Ambassador Mukta Thoma mentioned it was the air. When uh, uh, the TV in Germany showed how bad the air is and when Chancellor Merkel at our AGM was coughing a little bit, they all said, oh, this is the bad air in Delhi. Well, the air was very bad. At the moment, the air problem in Delhi is not the problem, but it might come back. So therefore, we are interested in your point on the topic of environment, how Danfoss is supporting the situation in India and how do you see the way forward? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bernard, and uh, good evening uh, to all the fellow panelists and uh, all the uh, people who are on the call uh, this uh, evening. And also thanks for inviting me to share uh, some of my perspectives. Uh, you know, I will, I will kind of share uh, it in two parts. Uh, the first is around uh, climate change. I think from, uh, from my point of view, climate change has not stopped for COVID. Uh, this has been an unprecedented year for, for people and planet. COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted lives. And at the same time, I think the heating of our planet and climate disruption has continued. I think the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere are at record levels and they are continuing to increase. Now, jumping a little bit into India, um, I think, uh, you know, India is uh, relying heavily on 70% of uh, the energy comes from the coal industry. Um, and it is a polluting industry, no doubt about it. Um, so the entire generation, the transmission and the consumption actually, uh, during COVID dropped by about 30%. And uh, many of us could see uh, from Chandigarh, you could see Himalayas, you know, in Chennai, you could see blue skies. Uh, in Bangalore, you suddenly, you know, found that everything was green around you. So I think, uh, it is very clear that climate change has a very significant impact on the air pollution. Um, but I think from our, from our point of view, we have a bigger air pollution that is uh, not really going noticed is the food loss air food loss in the country, actually. I mean, if you just look at the food loss, uh, approximately between you know 8% to 17% of different commodities put together is the third largest emitter of, of carbon emissions, you know, so, so there are two kinds of things to be fixed in India. And then there's, and, and apart from the 500 gigawatt of energy that is, uh, you know, produced in India, diesel generation is about 100 gigawatts that are coming in, actually. So a lot of diesel is also used uh, in this aspect. So what, I think from a, from a country point of view, I think we are working very closely with uh, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency. And we also have, uh, you know, a lot of work that's going on with the, the CII Green Building Council, where we are putting together a roadmap, uh, you know, from, from where we can kind of move and pivot to the way forward is to really look at deep digital decarbonization. And, and I will kind of explain to you what is this deep digital decarbonization where the roadmap is being drawn out by both the government as well as it. So the, the fundamental thing is about how can you make uh, companies, I'm sure, you know, Satyagam has got a big solar plant and, uh, you know, most of us have solar plants. And in the last three months, we have actually never switched on electricity from coal. We have been able to operate from solar energy and run our production simply because 50% of our people are working from home. So I think the, the first thing is to really look at how do we make the industry more uh, rely on renewables. And I think when you look around in India, we have done extremely well on, on bringing in LED bulbs. They've also done very well on bringing in a number of uh, uh, programs around uh, the perform achieve trade in the industry side where some of our cement plants have become globally competitive from an energy perspective. Steel plants have come, become very competitive from, a, from an energy perspective. I think the, the third area where I think we are moving towards is Solar was available only for about eight to nine hours. Now with the, with the decreasing prices of the batteries and newer technologies of batteries coming in three years from now, I believe solar would be even cheaper than coal, uh, which means round the clock solar would come in. And I think there is the way we generate electricity, the way we trans, trans, transfer electricity and the way we consume electricity is going to change in the next three years in India. So I think from my point of view, 
you know the energy efficiency uh, you know using more renewables is the only way out uh, uh, from a, from a, you know disrupting the cost perspective the second area i think you know some of my panelists here uh, you know i'm sure for example klaus uh, uh, klaus neumann spoke about the people moving to home but there's so much of digitalization is happening is we are also going to add a lot of uh, data centers in india and data centers are also going to be a big energy guzzlers uh, you know historically data centers were added in the northern part of scandinavia because the energy cost was less but now data centers are proliferating all over india actually so this is another big uh, thing so we really need to look at when we bring in these new uh, new loads into the into the operation how do we actually uh, you know embrace uh, energy transition and i think here we as a country i think we are working with the different stakeholders to make different roadmaps for example on the on the on the buses side we are working at how do we electrify buses which is one area that we are working very closely uh, the second area we are looking at the milk industry how do we decarbonize the milk industry the entire milk collection pooling the milk the supply chain model that goes into the dairy how do we decarbonize that so i think there are several initiatives that are running uh, you know industry wide multiple uh, uh, you know uh, stakeholders involved in it in an ecosystem approach to really decarbonize but i think the there are a, there are a little bit of uh, long term actions that are needed because this is not something we can fix climate change in 2 years or 3 years i mean it would probably take 3 to 5 decades to really get to zero emission which is what the ambition level is and that's what the european parliament is looking at using the concept of sector coupling i mean if you take transportation uh, you know after power which accounts for about 32% of the emissions in india uh, buildings industry and transport account for almost 60% of of the emissions in india so each of these sectors need to make a clear road map and and you need to actually bring in new technologies you need to innovate new technologies we need to work with a lot of startups and this is exactly the road map that we are working along with the different stakeholders i think the road ahead is uh, is challenging also but at the same time quite exciting because uh, you will continue to see a lot of uh, innovation happening uh, because of digital and i think digital uh, technologies are becoming you know resource liberating uh, as 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 i mentioned earlier that you know sitting at home you can actually have the ability to switch the service provider in a couple of years with the government looking at smart metering as well so i think from my point of view uh, you know of course the covid has uh, not stopped climate change but at the same time you know if we really want to focus on uh, you know the emission and set targets clearly i think we really need to look at uh, putting in uh, you know more focus of companies becoming carbon neutral uh, states becoming carbon neutral and there is no one size that fit all, fits all for all kinds of uh, you know industries so we need a sectorial road map and and i think we need to really look at some targets and measurable targets and you know trace back and i'm i'm staying very optimistic because india has made a big leap in the solar and renewable area and we still have huge opportunity to cash in and as as i mentioned many of us are already getting to a very close to 50% carbon neutral in in the way we work and live and it's a question of now pushing the envelope a little bit more to make it even more bigger and bolder from an energy transition perspective and i think technology embracing becomes a very critical factor for us from from here yeah ravi thank you very much i i'm not sure with whether uh, ms dr reddy has joined us in the meantime because i cannot see her uh, so therefore i think i would like to continue with class neumann um, and ravi has already mentioned it that digitalization will be the way forward in environment uh, but actually and that's my question to you um it looks as if even when it comes to vaccination in china you have found a digital vaccination which is your uh, yoga seti setu which is basically the mobile phone that is now used by everyone so and i understand you were also involved in putting up the system in germany i'm not sure but maybe you can uh, explain that to us and i understand in shanghai you have trade fairs again people are not wearing masks anymore people go out you have even october fests so it seems in china in many respects it's all back to normal and um this is because of 
their way to monitor the people moving around. And uh, uh, in India, we also have it. But why is it not so successful as yet? What do we have to do in India with your help, maybe with SAP helps, help to have this digital vaccination? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bernhard. And uh, indeed, um, it's a nice term, digital vaccination. Uh, but indeed. Uh, the, the digital solutions uh, play an enormous role, of course, in order to, to track infection chains and also to um, enact in, in, in the movement of people, of course. Right? And uh, basically what, what China indeed did is uh, it made it um, mandatory to use uh, an app which is um, managed by the provinces, but it has one common uh, data source, but nevertheless, Uh, each province says, okay, if you come to our province, our province app has to show a green status for you coming in because we want to know where you are from. And you have to use this green status if you enter a train, if you if you uh, go on a plane and whatsoever. Even now, as the COVID cases uh, here inside China are zero, this is still tracked that way. Yeah? And I believe um, that has certainly helped together, of course, with a very high level of um, discipline that was uh, expected uh, from the population and um, a, a consequent uh, management of that. Yeah? So I believe um, overall uh, these, these tracking apps um, help. Now, I, I, obviously, you can't make the use of an app uh, mandatory in every country of the world. In Germany, for example, where indeed Deutsche Telekom and SAP have developed the app together. It is um, it's more a contact app, so it's it's more for the user to give you an idea. Oh, I have been in contact with somebody, but it doesn't transmit data to anyone. Yeah, so it's a very very different system in Germany than it's in China, where the, in China it's more about the data gets uh, accumulated, and the government would like to know where are our cases, where, who is moving where, and basically track this and also put people accordingly under a uh, quarantine uh, and. Um, I believe in that way, uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't give you advice to India out of this experience because I know India is again a very different environment, but uh, smart digital solution have certainly proven to be also uh, a very successful, yeah, in a way, treatment of uh, the, the, the pace and uh, uh, an epidemic can actually uh, multiply itself. And yes, I have even a formal dress still today, obviously for all of you, but I have been today here on the CIIF, the China International Industry Fair, uh, where we also are one of the exhibitors where, where 10,000s of visitors are there. So indeed, um, business is going on. Chinese China economy, that's probably a bit of the irony of the history this year, is going to be the only large economy that will grow. Yeah, they, they predict uh, a 2% growth for the economy. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's probably what I can say for the moment. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Aya, actually, we were, we were supposed to be in Hanover these days for the International Truck Fair, uh, the IAA Truck Fair, which, of course, uh, cannot happen. So your big moment, so to speak, uh, is not happening and if at all it can happen online like the caravan salon which is currently on in Düsseldorf so there are trade fairs still going on um, but of course with a lot of distancing and with much less people now the question I have for you is that the Prime, Prime Minister Modi has declared a policy of self-sustainability so he wants to achieve that India is importing less and is more self-reliant And now, as we mentioned earlier, you were one of the first to make, make in India a success with more than 90% of your products being sourced in India. Uh, but uh, the challenge, and we had the discussion last week with the ACMA and SIME annual convention, uh, the challenge is how on short notice can you make India self-reliant, especially in the auto industry, um, of course, One tries to be more independent from China, where more than 14% of the Indian imports are coming. But the pressure, of course, is huge. And the new chairman of Siam has already said that for his company, Suzuki Maruti, they want to reduce the imports by 50%. Now, how is that possible 
in an industry that is so interlinked globally. That's my first point. And the second point is, if we were to change the supply chains, how can we at least have good supply chains between Germany and India and between Europe and India? Well, uh, Bernard, uh, first of all, I think we should not just move, try to move from one extreme to the other uh, because that's not practical. Right? There is a reason those supply chains exist like that today. Right? And if you want to change it, of course, it requires time, effort and also investments. Right? Uh, the other important dimension to all that is to build that capability in India, which uh, is lacking today. Right? If you look at... Uh, uh, the main imports, especially in the automotive segment, they are in the field of electronics, uh, emission technologies, and also uh, electric mobility or e-mobility, right? So uh, people are importing because those capabilities or those kind of scale, economic economies of scale don't exist in India today. Uh, I think uh, the automotive industry has to work on this in a very concerted manner in order to pick up those uh, technologies and create uh, local alternatives which are competitive as well right so it cannot be done by switching on a button it will require some years of hard work uh, but i can tell you at least from our side uh, as you said we uh, buy 90 percent locally uh, we want to take it up to minimum 95 in the next two years and possibly attempt 98 percent in three years time so this is what we are working on and uh, as I said, it will require all that effort uh, in the next three years to do so. Yeah, thank you. On the other side, uh, you know, uh, India should also look at uh, creating a base for exporting, like you talked about, between India and Germany. Uh, well, we do a lot of that. In fact, uh, the medium duty transmission, which is used in the trucks, globally, we produce only in India now. And we ship to uh, various parts of the world, in Germany being the main uh, country where it is used, right? Uh, similarly, we work with more than 100 suppliers of ours uh, and we export parts. We have a consolidation center inside our company and cumulatively we exported more than 130 million parts uh, to different parts of the world and mainly Germany. So I think uh, this balance of trade or the uh, equation is something which we need to look at and find where we find the best value uh, which the business needs. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm now very happy to welcome Dr. Sangeeta Reddy. Uh, warm welcome. Good evening. And, uh, good evening. And um, actually, when I look at the time, theoretically, we are now in the discussion time for question and answers. But actually, since I cannot see any questions in my uh, chat here, I think we just take the liber liberty of taking the... 10 minutes that we, the, more, uh, the, the other 20 minutes that we have. And now start with Dr. Reddy. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, and also I would like to uh, introduce the topic that we have discussed in our pre-discussion. And of course, um, uh, Apollo Hospitals being a pioneer in modern health service in India has gone through a total roller coaster also in the last half a year, everything has changed for you. On the other hand, you also try to look forward. And one of the fields that you are working on is digital health, which is basically doctor services from home, via camera, diagnosis, online. And there you even formed a new company and you're going really big. I think you have some 3 million patients already there. And this would be a topic which again, coming to the headline that we said, COVID-19, the never normal and the way out. And therefore, your input would be very much appreciated. Dr. Reddy, please. So uh, good afternoon and good evening. I think all of us are very clear. This, this is, like you said, the never normal. And while some people say that this is what could be termed a black swan event, I think some others are now saying that this is a stampede of elephants and there could be more to come. So whether it's climate change, another virus, disruption, socioeconomic upheaval, uh, global uh, geopolitical upheavals. So let us now first talk, say that innovation, 
the ability to move, to use technology, but to be empathetic, to be inclusive to the needs of people. And global leadership, collective leadership, multilateralism, these are lessons that we learned during this pandemic to protect us for the future. Coming directly to the question that you asked about the changes in the healthcare delivery system, clearly it's been approximately 261 days. And in this time, we kept hoping this is going to go away. This is not going to affect us so badly. So this uh, denial went to solutioning. Solutioning went to more innovation, went to this scenario of saying that what we're learning today can change behaviors for the future forever. I doubt that people are going to go to the hectic work schedules. I used to travel four times a week, be on a plane. Do you think any of us are going to do that again for a while at least? So, And we've now learned that we can communicate beautifully like this. Uh, and then the same comes for our patients. But I must say that companies that did the technology investments and the thought process on innovation earlier were able to quickly pivot. And that's really what Apollo Hospitals did. We've always worked on telemedicine. We understood the need for digital care. We've had an EICU set up before. We've done telepathology, teleradiology. But when this crisis hit, it was very easy to quickly turn on the mobile app, to reach out to our customer base and say, if you're worried about COVID, first take your COVID scan. The artificial intelligence enabled COVID risk scan was built by our team in under a week. And from the time that we introduced it to today, almost 13 million people took that scan. Over 3.5 million people remain engaged on the platform. They are doing teleconsults, they're buying pharmacy medication, they're ordering diagnostics, and more importantly, very soon, we will be giving them condition management, whether it's how to manage your diabetes or your hypertension. So behaviors which happened in the crisis will remain with us post-crisis is one of, I think, the first lessons that we are look, uh, looking at and anticipating. The second important thing is that uh, the pace of development of knowledge and information. In an earlier period, uh, we knew the importance of research and innovation, but currently there are 8,500 publications coming out every hour about COVID. We have created across our 7,500 beds, 2,500 beds have been kept for COVID. We have over 100 fever clinics. We have the online service. We've extended hotel rooms with telemedicine service so that we can treat patients, enabling in them isolation, yet having a medical overview or a coverage to them. And then finally is the home care where people can stay at home. And again, using telemedicine, we can take care of them. In this scenario, it was important to create the protocol and then to keep moving with the evolution of the new protocols. Because first people said HCQ, then we spoke about uh, steroid therapy, then came Favirepreur, then came Remdesivir, and the range of these treatments and the range of diagnostic tests. It was RT-PCR, rapid RT-PCR, antigen testing, antibody testing, and when do you do, which one do you do? So creating a formulation where we had a care protocol and this was uniformly followed and then continuously updated so that every one of our medical locations and every one of our call center um, medical assistants was saying the same thing and giving the latest protocol to patients who reached. So this is a, a scenario, a real life scenario of how technology, innovation, science and medicine, and most importantly, I think that the commitment to serve, to be able to go out there and take care of people, uh, because I think at the end of the day, what will be remembered of this pandemic is not just whether you survived, not if you managed to make money, but whether you did the right thing. How many people did you impact? Were you able to, to cure, to heal, to take care of your employees? And that has been really our focus for the last 260 days. Uh, while I've also been working at FIKI and finding ways uh, to ensure that uh, government policy, which has been quite fantastic in terms of uh, proactive emergency credit relief, 
um, policy changes which will enable strengthening of the business environments uh, per se, and multiple scenarios in terms of ensuring that supply chains were kept intact. We are now looking forward to, from the government, some level of demand stimulation. But overall, uh, I think this is about collective leadership and ensuring that no one gets left behind from what we know we can do for people. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reddy. That's indeed uh, very impressive. And to a certain extent, it's interesting. Um, of course, uh, today we talk about the people dying from Corona. But actually, last year and year before in India, so many people were dying from being obese, from having sugar, from having heart attacks because of un unhealthiness, basically from being sick because they're not moving. And I hope that this pandemic will be uh, a lesson learned also for everyone to look after their health much better. And with your system, uh, where you basically take along people to monitor their health, um, I hope this will stay. And therefore, shortly before you came, we were talking about the digital vaccination in China, where they basically use their mobile phone uh, to separate people so they don't catch the virus, which is a sort of digital vaccination. Now, with you and your new approach to health, to monitoring health, I think we can save many, many, many more lives than uh, before. And I hope that this lesson at least is learned. I would like to come back to Ravi with regard to the topic of environment. And you were talking about digitalization of protection of the environment. And the, uh, your big market is the farmers, agriculture. And in the field of agriculture, as you've mentioned, um, the way polluting water, you misusing energy, etc., is still huge. It has a lot to do with the education of the farmers. And how do you see digitalization in the farming industry going ahead because if we get more um, modern there and more digital there, again, we could save a lot of lives, a lot of energy, a lot of waste and pollution. And maybe together with Klaas Neumann, you can set up digitalization in farming. So what is your idea about that? Yeah, so... Uh... Bernard, I think there are uh, multiple levels of intervention already ongoing. I mean, if you look at uh, agriculture, uh, you know, there is a very strong nexus between food, water and energy. And, uh, and in India, I think you, you just mentioned about diabetic. And, uh, you know, we actually have been, uh, our agriculture has been more production driven for many, many years. And uh, we are kind of seeing more and more shift happening to become a demand-driven agriculture. So I think this has a significant uh, pivot, which will lead to use of a lot of digital technologies, uh, especially if you look at pre-harvest uh, technologies, there's a lot around uh, drip irrigation. You know, uh, now we are able to use the satellite images to look at the weather forecasting, uh, how much of water is needed for a plant. You can actually use AI and, and administer it um, and, and a lot of uh, a lot of technology interventions are happening, and and I think the second part is around the the post harvest. I mean, after the uh, the produce is harvested, we actually lose a lot between the farm and the supermarket. And here also, you can actually look at putting in a lot of traceability, because today consumers, uh, one of the things that has been very impactful in the post COVID scenario is. Uh, while most of them are at home, the demand for fresh fruits and vegetables has actually increased more than 40 percent. Uh, even though the spend on this has uh, come down by 20 percent, but there's a, there's, a, there's a tectonic shift in fresh. And how do you actually, and people are now asking in which farm it was produced, was it organic? Uh, you know, what temperature did it travel from that farm to my house? So there's a lot of technology intervention already happening. And, and here I'm, I'm, I'm glad to mention that uh, the startup ecosystem, uh, which is uh, basically really fueling this uh, today, uh, together with the three big ordinance the government has brought in here, 
a lot of technologies are getting more and more demystified and it is becoming as a service for farmers. Uh, so I'm very optimistic that, uh, you know, the next decade you will see agriculture becoming more digital agriculture, smart agriculture. And I think companies like uh, Class uh, have a very big role here. We probably need to cool more data centers in the future, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is actually, that is absolutely valid. And, you know, it's quite interesting. There's a big discussion going on in Germany at the moment about the, uh, the cost of a data center uh, and the energy it needs. And, uh, uh, you know, we have two different kinds of electricity. We have changed electricity and Gleichstrom, that's parallel electricity. And you, being a Siemens man, you know what I'm talking about. And yeah, then yeah. you have Gleichstrom, you don't need to convert. It's much more energy efficient. And with that, you can uh, uh, you can uh, energize big uh, data centers much, much cheaper. That's also an interesting, and of course, your ex-company Siemens being it, it's quite interesting. Now, unfortunately, we only have Another two minutes to go. Klaus Neumann just came back. He was uh, briefly locked out. Um, and therefore, maybe just at the end, since Dr. Reddy came in a little later, I would like to give the last word to you on behalf of FICI, you being the FICI president. Your sister was the CII president. So the, the Reddy family is very engaged in the society and the four sisters are basically running the show while the patriarch, their oh, father, yeah. is still very active and and my uh, data uh, broke remarkable. In the of my and, session. Uh, class, we can hear you. Wait, wait, don't, can't don't hear complain. Anyone anymore. I can't see anyone anymore. <laughs> but we can it hear you. Broke. <laughs> just, I don't know. Okay, why. so Dr. Reddy, um, my question to you would be, what is Fiki's strategy on the pandemic, on the way out of this crisis, And how can maybe associations like yours, like CII, Ravi being a CII man, like Indogerm Chamber of Commerce, uh, work together to basically make the world a better world after Corona? So what a beautiful question. Um, thank you very much. I think um, our overall strategy has really been, number one, to help people survive, to help companies survive. First, from the medical crisis, so we worked with multiple agencies, whether it was in ramping up of the supply of PPEs. And India was a country that manufactured only 10,000 PPEs in, in January. And today we're doing 450,000 PPEs per day. Uh, so it was assisting industry to respond to the need of the crisis, disseminating information. Whether it's so, we did a simple thing everybody follow SMS, which is sanitize, mask, and social distancing. And we spread the word about SMS everywhere because this was our contribution to contain the spread. Uh, the stay I concept, where over 4,500 hotel rooms were brought under the purview of treatment, was a FICI joint Apollo initiative. So, uh, first survive, then the next step is to enable businesses to survive. So emergency credit, loans, supply chains, restarting of the sector, all those were the focuses. So working with uh, the ministries, the group of ministers. From survive, then comes revive. So in the revive phase, which I think we are in now with the partial, with the uh, opening up, there's the partial ramping up of all the economic indices. Many factories are at 50 to 60%, 60 to 70%. So this is the time where we need to ensure supply, but also stimulate demand. So on the demand stimulation side, there are multiple steps which we've been recommending to the government uh, from uh, an urban Mandrega scheme, like a furlough scheme, uh, to coupon scheme, to demand stimulation, to money in the hands of people, but also to protect businesses. And here I think whether it's the RBI, the SEBI, the government, the finance ministry, Many steps are being taken with the single initiative that we should not allow companies to go bankrupt. We shouldn't lose our businesses because this also protects jobs. But after you survive and you revive the economy, we also believe that this is a once in a generation, a once in multi generation opportunity to look at macroeconomic policy, 
and to reset the economic environment so that India thrives, that we continue our dream to become a $5 trillion economy, but we do so in an inclusive manner. We do so with a focus on green energy. We do so with the protection of the environment. And we ensure that our recovery is not a K-shaped recovery where only the profitable businesses come forward and push up the sensex, but that all businesses move up. We also want to ensure that we protect our art, our artisans, our culture, our education, and our healthcare, and of course, the protection of women and children. So it's a multi-sectorial, 360 degree, uh, not just immediate term, but long-term strategy uh, that takes the country along, but also looks at India's position as part of uh, the Committee of Nations. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I think we've come to the end of our discussion round. Uh, uh, we could continue for much, much longer, but unfortunately, our friends in Germany have given us a very tight schedule, and therefore, I have to uh, stop now. And actually, I don't know whether you know, whether everybody knows what FIKI really means. Well, it's very simple. It means fight Indian's corona crisis immediately. And that is what we are doing today. So thank you very much for joining us for that discussion round. And I, I hand over to the uh, organizers back in Berlin. Thank you very much. And thank you, enjoy the thank you everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Vineet Martin. I'm a principal at Yoga Asia Consulting, a management consulting firm, which is a knowledge partners for the Embassy of India's Make in India Milk Start program. And today I'm here for, let's say, the next uh, 10 minutes to really tell you about uh, this um, Make in India st Middle Start or the MI initiated that was started in 2015 uh, by the Embassy of India. And um, I, I think if you got to reflect back at the past uh, eminent speakers who have spoken about it, of course, we are going through an unprecedented situation. But you also heard uh, from, uh, from, the, from the eminent minister that the government of India is... Uh, really working towards, um, let's say, easing the business situation in India, even during this pandemic, and looking at what opportunities may really arise for, for specific industries, especially. Um, this Make in India Middle Start program is really a, um, an end-to-end -end platform that the Embassy of India initiated in 2015, which, which really makes sense uh, for German investors who are looking at let's say, entering the Indian market or even expanding or penetrating into the Indian market. So, um, telling you about uh, the Make in India Mill Start program, it's basically, like I said, a one-stop shop uh, platform for German investors uh, looking at market entry as well as growth. And the, the initiative really has brought together, uh, let's say, knowledge partners, um, really subject matter experts as well, across different um, areas where businesses need support in while entering the market. So uh, giving you a perspective of the different partners that are part of the program, uh, you have a facilitation program which uh, partners which have Invest India and, and you also have the state investment boards across north to south, uh, east to west, uh, you name the state. Uh, we, we have uh, states like uh, Punjab, West Bengal, Maharashtra, um, these are, let's say, facilitation partners to really answer your key queries about uh, what incentives or, or what um, um, promotional schemes that these states are offering when you're looking at entering into the market. Um, of course, EAC is a knowledge partner. We've been working with the Embassy of India since 2015, and, and we really focus on bringing in the market insights, both from an industrial perspective or talking about functional uh, yeah, perspective, um, be it um, organic strategies or inorganic m &A strategies, as well as topics focused on operational excellence as well. And we also have tax and legal partners, Khetan and Co, as well as Rodel and Partner. Uh, from a banking side, you have Deutsche Bank, uh, as well as KFWDG. On the German side, you also have uh, uh, State Bank of India on the Indian side. We, of course, have the AHAKA, uh, Chamber of Commerce, as well as technology partners, that is Gita as part of the entire platform. So what does what does MIM really do? So we basically have a key hotline, an email account as well, where companies were looking at the Indian market and you have any queries uh, about the market or the financial system or any related to any questions related to banking and financing, you basically give us a call. And, and this is the first, uh, let's say, um, uh, Entry into the entire platform, and this is where we want to listen to your query. Uh, also, give you a perspective of how we can support you. Um, the next, uh, let's say, value add really is about these workshops as well as webinars, especially webinars in the current scenario, where we uh, where we basically focus on key topics within the industry or within the market that you may have queries about, and we conduct these workshops as well as webinars where we invite them. In. My members, and um, it's it's a fantastic opportunity to be able to uh, listen to key subject matter experts who basically come and speak at these workshops as well as webinars. Uh, the next one is more focused on dedicated workshops. So if you have a key query about a specific subject, um, this is where we basically prepare uh, the insights related to the Indian market. Uh, targeting your questions and we conduct these workshops in person or electronically under the current situation. And of course, uh, these these are also, uh, let's say, followed up by projects, which is basically part of the program. So just to clarify, of course, I mean, uh, the Make in India Middle Start program is a free of cost program really brought together by the Embassy of India for Middle Start companies, as well as, um, let's say, overall German companies. Then we also have the exchange platform. Uh, this happens annually. Um, 
in the past years it has happened actually at the the embassy itself in Berlin, which uh, incorporates an exhibition, live uh, panel discussions, much like what we had today, and of course a networking event where you can collaborate with potential customers or or even um, let's say the stakeholders that you're looking at from your supply chain uh, ecosystem perspective. So it's really bringing in different platforms as well as uh, different stakeholders uh, when we talk about the Indian ecosystem uh, together to really bring about uh, a, a very concrete uh, platform that can that can really support you. Um, how do you become part of the MR program? Well, it, it's, a, it's a pretty straightforward process. So once you give us a call or once you email us about your query um, and you want to be part of the MR program, we send out a questionnaire to you. Um, which basically details out uh, your your company's uh, presence in India, if you're already here, if you're not, what kind of um, entry strategies you're looking at, but when are you looking at, what are your key targets, and of course, what are your key, um, let's say, questions that you have where we can really bring about a customized approach for you. Uh, once you send us this filled-in questionnaire, we analyze it, of course, we discuss it with the Embassy of India as well, and together we have... Um, a meeting or a call with um, with you to be part of this uh, MIM program. If if uh, let's say the synergies really match for for the for the program as well as you as a member company, we send out an onboarded onboarding letter and you basically become a part of the MIM program and you are able to use avail of all the services that are provided by the uh, MIM program. Um, the key topics, um, this is uh, an important uh, part of what topics does MIM focus on. So starting with tax and legal topics, uh, questions about custom duties, procedures. Um, then we have also support for business visas, MIM recommendation letters and so on. Uh, we also uh, focus on, let's say, uh, strategic topics like um, market entry financing, you have market assessment technical feasibility, strategy formulations, and so on. And then we come also back to the real operation topics like land allotment, location analysis. And of course, when we talk about inorganic strategies, we also look at, um, let's say, potential cooperation models that could be executed in the Indian market when we talk about joint ventures or acquisitions and so on. And again, from a human resource perspective as well, these are key operational support topics that the, the MIM program really brings together for, for a smooth entry as well as a smooth growth in the market. Yeah. So what has what has MIM really achieved in the past five years? I told you that we started in 2015. So since then, uh, the program has onboarded 145 members uh, with a consolidated turnover of close to 100 billion euro. Um, these companies, uh, let's say the, the companies that have declared their investments, this totals up to close to 1.4 billion euro. And this includes close to 70 manufacturing plants, about 25 expansions, as well as 22 subsidiaries. Um, during our facilitation, this is a key KPI. If you see, we have handled, handled over 380 queries. We have conducted over 107 workshops, 34 webinars, and of course, five exchange platforms over the past five years. And this really is going towards the um, Make in India objective. Uh, it, it, we, we basically, um, there are investments worth close to 450 million euro, which have already been implemented, close to 20 manufacturing plants. And there's, then there's another 490 million euro worth of investments, which are in progress right now. Um, these are, let's say, this gives you a perspective of the uh, industry split uh, amongst the 145 members. So you can clearly see the manufacturing segment holds about a good, let's say, uh, a good 50, uh, not manufacturing, let's say, when we talk about the core industrial uh, sectors, um, when we talk about automotive or consumer goods, um, these are the core uh, manufacturing sectors. And we also have uh, renewables, which is a key focus area of us. Um, there are about 10%, let's say about 15 companies uh, that are coming from the renewable region. And then you also have new topics like waste and water management, uh, uh, focus industries, industrial companies, uh, another 15 to 16 companies within the segment. 
So it's it's very diversified, um, but then you also have new topics and really talking about uh, companies that focus on uh, preventing climate change and so on, which are also part of the environment. Yeah. Um, maybe giving you a perspective of some key companies that have announced invest investments. So it, you can also see the, the announcements are pretty diverse across regions, across industries. Uh, we're talking about companies like Shedel, and uh, you have Grable, which focuses on automotive components. They have invested in states like Rajasthan as well as Punjab. Mm -hmm. And you also have uh, Senbion, which invested close to 70 million in Maharashtra. Uh, Liebe again um, invested close to 70 million in, in Maharashtra again. So you have, um, let's say, a good amount of investments which are going into the states that are part of the MIM members, MIM program partners as well. So. Maybe uh, to give you a perspective, uh, let's say uh, uh, a bird's eye view of the investments, you can see that a majority of, uh, let's say, the investments, uh, close to 20, 20 member companies have invested in Maharashtra, uh, close to about 250 million euro. The next, or pretty much in the same uh, lines as Tamil Nadu, where seven, seven member companies have invested again another 250 million, followed by Karnataka, uh, Punjab, as well as Gujarat. So uh, the key highlights about Maharashtra, um, what we thought is we have, in fact, a short video for you to uh, watch as well to give you a perspective of uh, a very on-ground, uh, let's say, view of what really Maharashtra is about. We also have a video which I will play right now, and then we come back to um, my end of the presentation as well. India is a fast developing economy and an emerging industrial powerhouse. In this growth spree, a state that had contributed immensely and continues to be the most ideal for industrial investment for companies from all across the globe is Maharashtra, the most industrialized state in the country. Welcome to Maharashtra. It is your next global investment destination. Accounting for more than 30% of India's foreign direct investment, 22% of the country's exports, and with global business hubs like Mumbai and Pune, your investment has found its new home. Now let us quickly take an overview of Maharashtra's pivotal strengths. Maharashtra is at a strategic geographical position on India's map. It is very well linked to major industrial hotspots of the country through excellent roads road, air, and port connectivity. Maharashtra is the largest economy in India, contributing the most in the country's GDP growth year after year. In fact, the figures show that Maharashtra's gross state domestic product growth rate has consistently outperformed India's GDP growth rate for the last three years. With the lion's share of more than 30%, it has also attracted one-third of India's FDI inflow. With close to 7 lakh crore rupees in industrial investment proposals that the state has received in the recent past, it is unarguably the most favorite choice of global giants. With a vision to become India's first trillion dollar subnational entity, the socio-economic overview of Maharashtra is as promising as ever. These are the major advantages that complement each other outcome focus, favorable demographics, booming economy, seamless infrastructure, growing digitalization. The nodal agency of MIDC, the Maharashtra Industrial Development Corporation, has always played a vital role in the state's progress. These are a few notable and path-breaking initiatives of MIDC that always create a lasting impact. Global, national and statewide road shows, several national and international level events to boost brand magnetic Maharashtra, technological support and ease of doing business, continuous acceleration of growth through leads, intelligence and benchmarking, global investment summits organized at the world's leading cities, mission engagement through regular connect programs with more than 12 mission embassies and consul generals, end-to-end -end deal support for every new entrant, quarterly roundtables and surveys to solicit feedback and develop action plans. 
As a result of these continual thoughtful efforts, a wide range of top-notch industry giants have chosen Maharashtra as their base for futuristic expansion in India. These are big names from leading sectors, auto and auto components, chemical, defense, ESDM, food and agro, pharmaceutical, IT and IT enabled services, textile, gems and jewelry. Needless to say, an inspiring and exhaustive list of visionary, growth-savvy German companies are also flourishing in Maharashtra. These names are only suggestive as many German companies exist in various industrial hubs across the length and breadth of the state. The government of Maharashtra is aiming at Mission Magnetic Maharashtra through foreign direct investment of 10 lakh crore rupees and employment for more than 40 lakh skilled and semi-skilled employees. Mission Magnetic Maharashtra 2.0 promises features like plug and play infrastructure, allowing an FDI investor to utilize a ready-to-use infrastructure. Mahaparvana. This means developing a minimal permission system for FDI investors in a maximum timeline of 48 hours. Relationship manager and relationship executives for all the investors as nodal points of contact. An e-marketplace website to connect foreign investors with local partners and state suppliers. And Maha Jobs is a dedicated jobs portal to help industries meet the talent shortfall. And if where to invest in Maharashtra is a question lingering in your mind, have a look at these various industrial hubs with large land banks for key sectors as mentioned here. So, all in all, this is just a brief introduction of your next global investment destination, Maharashtra. As you come forward and join hands, we assure you, that you would be pleasantly surprised to explore the promise and commitment this land of opportunities has to offer. Because we firmly believe in the fact that together we are made for business. Right, so ladies and gentlemen, um, maybe before I, I give the floor um, a quick um, an update about the workshops and webinars that I spoke about. We in fact have one coming up uh, in the next few weeks on the 23rd of uh, September. We have a webinar scheduled uh, on insights and opportunities in Indian wind turbine manufacturing ecosystem. This is of course going to be conducted together with uh, PWE as well as IGEF. Um, I would strongly recommend uh, that you take note of uh, book your dates uh, for this webinar. And you can, of course, contact us on, on our contact details and we can tell you more about this webinar and, of course, about the MR program by itself. So, um, like I mentioned, uh, please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, our email is mim at indianembassy.de and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and stay healthy. I wish you all a very nice evening. Bye-bye.
spatial space or not. In Sekunden das steht verschwindet, mach ich keinen Läufer. So, wird es lang? Ja. Okay. So, I think technical difficulties have been overcome. Your Excellency Ambassador Tomar, Ian Mark Hauptmann, a member of the German Parliament, and to all participants in India. Again, and all participants in India know that MMA in China is just streaming that to more than 1,000 people in there and to all participants in Germany. First of all, I have to compliment Ambassador and Mark Hauptmann. He's not giving up political terms, but strengthening the relations between India and Germany and turning a crisis into opportunity. And that is exactly what we as the motto of this event today, turning a crisis into opportunity. Ambassador Thoma has clearly outlined. I don't know, colleague. Um, yes, yes, yeah. Okay, now I think all the technical difficulties have overcome. Your Excellency Ambassador Thomas, Gilmar Taubmann, member of the German Parliament, and to all the participants in India, I know that currently MMA in Chennai is streaming that event to some thousand participants and to all the ones in Germany. First of all, I have to compliment Ambassador Thoma and Mark Hauptmann for not giving up in critical times. You have really done maybe what could be the green line through this event, and the topic is turning a crisis into opportunity and not giving up. So thank you for doing that. Ambassador Thoma has clearly outlined the advantage of Indian economy for cooperation with German companies. And what I found even more important, she has given it a political perspective and making clear that India and Germany are very often sharing the same, if not at least similar values. And values are a prerequisite for sustainability in the future. And she has mentioned the example of climate change and environment protection, but it's not limited to that one. Mr. Hans-Peter Friedrich has then clearly lined out that to channel resources should be done into modernization and not
Union. And yet, what is not settled yet, but again, the crisis could be a chance uh, to turn this one into an opportunity and look closer into it. To turn a crisis into opportunity is also India's motto, as His Excellency Minister Anurag Thakur has mentioned. And he brought up the sample of the role of technology and how it led to a kind of revolution in India. COVID-19 had unsettled the world, but again used the chance and tried to make something out of it. He mentioned his 20 years of relations with India and Deutschland. And I can only say, dear Anurag, we are looking forward to having future 20 years of relations with India and Germany together with you. We had a podium discussion uh, led by Mr. Steinbrücke, and it was picked up the question with industry leaders from India. The question was picked up, what's the way out of this situation? And that was also picking up on the question by Mr. Bingman, how could we bring business back to a normal situation? At the end, we were listening to the presentation of Vinet Martin about making India middle stand. And I hope that his presentation has encouraged investors to go to India, to invest there and make use of the advantages the Indian economy can offer, as Ambassador Omar has mentioned it in the beginning. The honor that I can do the closing remarks does not mean that we are closing the event now. Our networking sessions are about to begin. So let me thank again everyone who has participated, who has joined us, who has given his insight. And now we are starting soon our networking sessions. You can visit several team rooms in parallel and network there. Select the item sessions. So sessions is a button on your left menu bar. Then you will see different rooms. You can now watch or make a request to the moderator to be present with audio and video to ask your questions. It may take a short moment until you receive the approval for the moderator. So I'd like also to use the chance to announce that I'm here from the CAS Konrad Adenauer Foundation in Berlin, the Academy. From here, we will start a site session also looking at what was mentioned several times, Akmania Babara, the tendency of nations now to try to be more self-reliant. And we have with us guests from ICREA and from SWP, two leading think tanks, and we will soon address this topic. So I'll hand back that technically and hopefully without problems, the networking session can be started. Thank you everyone for joining us. And as Mark Hauptmann has mentioned, it's the fifth time we're increasing in the German relations. It's the fifth time in this format, but I think increasing in the German relations is for us everyday business, all of us mm -hmm. participating, and we will continue. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.